audible or not. Yeah. Thank you. I am not able to hear you. Ma'am, am I audible? Professor Maima, can you hear me? Okay, let me check. Hello. Hello. Professor Mehma, can you hear us? I think she's not able to hear. I guess. I've written to everybody. Let me also check my uh, screen share. Ada, can you check? Do I have permission to share my screen? Yes, ma'am. You have the permission. It is showing we can't display or share content. Make sure you have allowed it. Adi, let me join through uh, app. I guess it, the feature is not supported in a browser. Let me log in using app. Okay, okay, ma'am. Okay.
Ma'am, your presentation is visible now. Okay, thank you so much for confirming. Can we start? Yeah, just give me one minute. I'll uh, talk to Professor Bolia once, then we can okay. begin. Sure. Good evening, everyone. I, Adya Pandey, welcome you all to the 13th session of the PSPO webinar series. Today, we have with us Dr. Harpreet Kaur and Dr. Mahima Gupta from Indian Institute of Management, Amritsar. Dr. Harpreet Kaur is an assistant professor in the area of quantitative methods and operations management. Her research interests include sustainable business operations, optimization, mathematical modeling, disruptive technologies, disaster relief operations and procurement management. Her teaching interests are operations management, supply chain management, Six Sigma, project management and optimization techniques. Our core speaker for today is Dr. Mahima Gupta, who is an associate professor at IIM Amritsar. Her research focuses on developing decision-making models for situations involving multiple dimensions under an uncertain environment. Today, they have joined us to discuss their work on agri-food supply chain network design pertaining to public distribution system in India. I would now request our speakers to please begin with their presentation. Thank you, Aitya. First of all, let us both thank the entire team of PSL for hosting us and giving us an opportunity to discuss our research on a public distribution system in India. Uh, as you can see on my screen, this is the paper that we are going to present. It is multi echelon food agri supply, uh, agri food supply chain network design, integrating both operational and strategic objectives. And we have taken a case of uh, food, public distribution system in India. See, our work on public dis uh, distribution system. The motivation came because these systems are inherently complex to manage because of their multi echelon structure. And when it comes to food distribution, food quality also deteriorates with time and any change in storage condition can lead to a huge amount or significant amount of food loss. In this paper, we have tried to mathematically model the integrated functions of procurement, storage and distribution, how it will happen end to end with the joint objective of improving traceability as well as bringing resilience into the network design. So hence the proposed model, model integrates both short term operational objectives which are obviously minimizing cost and minimizing food loss with a long term sustainable policy of having a more resilient uh, food distribution system. This is a snapshot of the paper that has been published with annals of war. See, when it comes to food loss, India India is a, see now we are self-sufficient country in terms of food production. We are rather exporting food grains to other countries, but still we are rated very high on global hunger index. Why we are producing more and still there is a lot of uh, food hunger. The main reason that when we were researching about this problem was that there is a lack of proper storage facilities in our country. Despite we are growing in numbers when it comes to our public food procurement or food grain procurement, but still our storage capacity is uh, very insignificant in comparison to the numbers that we are procuring year on year. 
some facts to support our cases that uh, even CAG report has also uh, shown that our storage capacity is alarmingly low in comparison to our procurement. The existing infrastructure that we have is insufficient to protect the food grains against any kind of moisture or rodents. Another report shows that we waste or damage worth $14 billion of food grain annually. So these are all the numbers that we have taken into consideration while modeling a public food uh, distribution system. So in our model, we are trying to uh, model a public food distribution system wherein we can also decide where to locate existing or augment the existing capacity to support the procurement. But we have taken into consideration that all the additional facilities that we will be making will be steel silo storage. So when it comes to food grain storage, there are open go downs where you can see that there are a lot of uh, uh, you know, jute packs uh, in which grain is stored and that that particular facility is not able to uh, protect against any climatic conditions or any kind of uh, rodents or pe uh, pests that can exist. So steel storage can be temperature controlled wherein food quality can be monitored, hence food loss can be avoided. And these are the experts from the action plan for the construction of seeds, uh, steel silos by FCI, wherein we are proposing that for the bulk storage and bulk movement, steel silos will be constructed. So this is the structure of the problem that we are considering for the mathematical modeling. We are considering that mainly procurement will happen in the food producing uh, for any particular gain procurement will happen in the producing states. That is a stage one from wherein whatever food grain that we have procured will be stored in the stage one storage which will happen in the same stage. Now in same state since we already have go downs which are rather traditional where uh, food grains are stored in traditional ways which are not uh, sufficient they can be uh, the storage facilities can be a combination of silos and go downs but if capacity is insufficient in that particular stage there can be more silos that can potentially new silos can be located and the same scenario could also happen in a consuming stage which we are considering as a stage two of our multi load supply chain uh, structure wherein in a consuming stage all state also there can be a situation where there is a demand but there is an inadequate uh, storage facility to store the grain before it reaches to the market and we are assuming that where demand is happening in the marketplace there is little or no uh, storage facility so that means in every period where there is demand we have to ensure that that much amount of quantity is sent we are assuming that there is no storage space there. So in our model, we are trying to answer different questions. First, that how existing capacity can be augmented, where exactly new silos should be located, both in consuming and producing stage, which we are also referring to as stage one and stage two, to construct a long-term resilient supply chain network. Then how much grain should be stored and transported from one node to another node in the supply chain? Now, in this case, the objective of this question is to improve end-to-end -end visibility that how exactly quantity is moving from between in between different stages. Now, the third one is how we can achieve this by controlling cost, wastage and building resilience of the supply chain at the same time. So, these are all conflicting objectives, how trade-offs can be established. So, how we have studied the trade-offs. Now, before we actually model, we went to literature to see how other people have addressed these problems, if not in India, in other uh, countries where they have studied the public distribution systems or agri-food multi echelon supply chain systems. What we have figured out is people have studied different supply chain functions in isolation. For example, people have focused on procurement or warehouse location or the network routing design or minimizing the waste. In terms of objectives also, they have either considered cost or overall coordination or wastage, but in isolation. 
we have also uh, studied that what are the methods what is the nature of their objective are they operational in nature or strategic in nature what are the methods that they have used for example for most of the strategic studies they have adopted for empirical and theoretical frameworks whereas when operational objectives are considered considered they have either use mcdm or analytical modeling now the beauty of this work is we have actually tried to integrate end to end supply chain considering both long term short term objectives integrating both qualitative and quantitative techniques in a single model now when we went to research uh, when we went to literature we figured out that there are gaps there is a lack of research on overall strategic design of agri food supply chains there is lack of research on building strategic resilience in the network by augmenting the existing capacity and there are lack of models which address long term strategic objectives along with short term objectives in agri food supply chain systems considering this there are three research objectives that our model intends to address first is we want to obtain each potential site that we have in consideration we want to obtain that is there a way that we can calculate their resilience score in a multi actual system both in the consuming and the producing states now can we propose a framework for integrated as well as well coordinated decision making regarding procurement storage and distribution in a multi actual food supply chain integrating the objectives of cost food loss minimization and resilience maximization third is can we develop a solution methodology to solve this multi objective problem and obtain optimal trade offs between three conflicting objectives and we have also carried out detailed computational analysis wherein we have compared different problem scenarios of different sizes so this is the proposed framework wherein if you see these three circles represent the scope of each objective so in the first one we are actually trying to establish a mechanism to figure out or to evaluate the resilience score of each site using a mcdm technique called topsis then we are using the resilience score into a score into our mathematical model to uh to optimally integrate procurement storage and distribution considering cost resilience and food loss minimization and then the th third one is we develop a solution methodology to solve the problem and study the trade offs that exist in the problem now for the purpose of resilience score calculation we have considered seven uh, criteria that are important for any site that you want where if we want to locate our silos for example when we talk about bulk grain movement bulk storage the benefit of bulk storage can only be realized if there is also a bulk transportation facility available so availability of a railway siding is very important then what is the space that is available because space directly translates to the capacity what is the proximity to the mandi for example when we are talking about a uh, producing state it is proximity to different procurement centers that we call mandis the same criteria will become proximity to the demand centers when it comes to the uh, uh, consuming states then what is the frequency of any kind of natural disaster and what is the overall terrain of that particular site seismicity of that site what is the utility supply at each site for example it should not be as to more that you don't get you know enough people to work with or enough power there what are the policies of local government so based on this we have developed this also contains the expert feedback and we have actually developed a matrix where we are considering that eight potential sites and what is the rating of each site against each um criteria in this apart from the first criteria all other ratings follow 9 point scale but here we have just used pinty because either there is availability of railway siding or there is not uh, i am skipping the steps of topsis but topsis is a tool wherein you can you both use ratings as well as the data for example here in space uh, we have used ratings but if actual data is available we can actually use number that how much space is available in terms of proximity also we can use kilometers so that model does not differentiate your result will not vary if there are ratings or numbers so the final score 
that we have calculated using TOPSIS is that each site will have a rating. We call it resilience index or resilience store. The higher the number is, that means more resilient that location is. Now we will use this resilience score that we have calculated in our mathematical model. Now in our mathematical model, before I discuss the model, let us understand what I'm trying to find out, what are the constraints and given the objectives that I've already mentioned. The model will try to answer where to locate a new silo, both in producing as well as in consuming state and how much grain is transporting from one node to another node. The moment I say node, it can be from a mandi to a, a storage facility in the producing state or between the storage facilities between a producing and a consuming state or between consuming state to retail uh, or demand centers how it is moving so between different nodes how grain is moving this all variables will be answered that means end-to-end -end visibility we will get then how much grain to be stored at a node given in a particular time period, given a particular temperature. Now, uh, when it comes to silo storage, we have considered a particular temperature. There should be certain degradation that is happening. Now, to maintain the silos at a particular temperature, there is also cost. So, our model also tells us that given the food loss or the trade-off between food loss and cost, what kind of temperature I should keep so that Wastage is also minimized along with the cost. Now my constraints are obviously there are capacity constraints at different uh, uh, facilities. For example, every go down, every silo at every stage in the supply chain will have a capacity constraint. At the end, at the retail points, there are demand constraints that this much demand we need to meet. We have also have to balance the stock or inventory at different nodes. Also considering that there is also degradation of the or the food loss that is happening because of the degradation in food quality. Now objective functions are cost minimization, food loss, food loss minimization and maximization of network resilience. Okay. Uh, the model obviously to model this problem we have taken certain assumptions. For example, we have taken an assumption that the quantity of grain that is to be procured at each Monday or each procurement center is known to us with certainty. Now, all the procurement centers will procure the agriculture produce and send that exact amount to the for the storage in the go-downs and silos in the stage one facilities only. So if production is happening in, uh, procurement is happening in producing stage, so initial storage will also happen in stage one only. So there are already functional go-downs and silos. So we already have a existing storage facility, but since we have already established that there is a lack of adequate uh, storage facility, there might be a case where we might have to locate a new storage facility. First, that will always be a silo, which is temperature control and uh, that can that situation can happen both in producing as well as in consuming state now each site that we have both in or potential site that we have will have a resilience index that we can have already calculated now go downs are not temperature controlled and we have taken that a certain fixed amount of degradation is happening there however silos are temperature controlled their degradation rate is linked to the temperature that is maintained at their silo. So these are the indices that we have used because M, M stand for the Mondays, uh, the procurement centers, uh, G that means go downs, G dash go downs at stage two. Similarly, E means existing silos, E dash existing silos at stage two. S and S dash are the sites for the new style silo at stage one and stage two of the supply chain. Now each silo, we have an option to decide which size. So there are size options. For example, it can range from 5,000 metric tons to let's say 2 lakh metric tons. What kind of silo, size of silo will be constructed? How many detail points are there? Index for time and index for temperature. So these are all the variables where we were actually trying to find out what is the quality quantity of food grain between different stages that I have already mentioned. So if for example alpha mg is between mandi and a go down. Alpha me means between mandi and an existing silo. Since procurement only happens once in a, a year so that means it is independent of time. 
but the after that between the st uh, storage facilities for example between silo and, uh, between silo and producing and consuming stage that is happening throughout the year because demand is there throughout the year so that is a function of time and also there are binary variables uh, which will tell us whether at a particular site we are construct constructing a silo of a particular size or not Similarly, there are inventory uh, variables which will tell us how much inventory that we are maintaining. When it is go down, it is at a certain time period. When it is in a silo, it is at a certain time period at a certain temperature also because silos inventory is also a function of temperature. These are all the parameters that I am taking because capacity is known, train procurement is known, cost is known to us. So some of the parameters that I want you to consider here, I have considered that because budget is also limited. So maybe there is with every state, the maximum number of silo or the projects can that can be set at a given point of time are fixed. So I'm taking that uh, there is a cap on maximum number of silos that can be constructed. Similarly, we have considered the proportion of distance travel between two storage facilities it could happen that there uh, is a certain amount of distance and the distance can be partially traveled using either roadways or railways we have not used waterways here either rail or road and then we can say that 80 percent of distance was traveled by road and 20 percent by train or vice versa that is just for the purpose of calculation of the transportation cost Similarly, we have considered degradation rate is known to us at a certain temperature. Degradation rate at a go down is also taken as a lump sum figure. And resilience to uh, index of the potential site, both at stage one and stage two that we have calculated, this goes as a parameter to now mathematical model. Now, given the parameters that the variables that I have explained, there are constraints. For example, at the stage one in the producing stage, there are certain capacity constraints. For example, how much I am procuring and sending to a particular facility should be less than the capacity of that particular facility. And the same holds true the moment it is a go down, it should be less than go down's capacity. If it is an existing silo, it should be less than the capacity of existing silos capacity if you are also planning to send some amount to the potential silo new silo then what will be the capacity and whether i'm constructing this whether there is a silo constructed at that particular place or not so that is how mind is in picture so that means how much grain i'm sending to different uh, storage facilities in a stage one should be equal to total procurement that has happened in that year and the last two constraints are actually telling me these two that out of all the possible options of size that is Q, only one size is possible. Either it is zero or one. So either we are not we are not constructing a silo there, or if it is getting constructed, there is just one size that will be there. And the total number of silos that are constructed should be less than or equal to the maximum number of projects that can be started. So that is maximum number of silos that can be added. Now there are also capacity constraints at the stage two that are consuming states. Now whatever we are sending from the producing state to the consuming stage should be less than equal to their residual capacity. Now their residual capacity, that means this is a multi-time period problem now. Whatever is was the original capacity minus how much it is actually containing right now. So that is it's it's the uh, that is the existing capacity. That means maximum it it can hold. So that holds true for different kinds of facility, be it go down existing silos or potential silos. And the last two are again the same constraints that even in the consuming state uh, any silo can have exactly one size if there are q dash number of size options only one kind of size can be decided and total number of projects at the stage two can also be limited by the number defined by the government now these are all inventory balance constraint balance stock balancing is happening at the different stages for example at all the go downs in temperature one at, at time period one whatever is the inventory that means 
how much procurement is ha has happened minus whatever I have sent out to other states. Subtracting whatever I have sent to, to other state is whatever I'm having currently. Now, after time period one is over, time, at time period two, we have also considered that degradation will also happen in every time period. So now, whatever inventory is remaining, adding whatever degradation has happened over it, minus whatever we are sending from time period uh, two onwards, is the remaining capacity. And that logic applies to different facilities that I have considered for Godown, for existing silos, for new silos that we will be constructing, the same logic will apply. And here I'm considering that at any, uh, see, in, in when, uh, at any uh, inventory can only be stored at one of the temperature. So there are temperature options, so inventory will be hold on any of the one temperature option. And in the end, whatever we are sending from the storage facilities in the consuming stage to the demand detail point, any detail point can receive multiple shipments from different facilities. It should be equal to the demand that it is there. And then these two constraints are here. The grain transfer between two potential sites can only happen when both of the sites are located. That means if binary is one there, only then alpha will take a positive value. And all the grain um, transportation that will be happening is the continuous variable. And uh, UQS and UQS dash are binary because it is telling us whether we will be locating a silo there or not. For the purpose of, okay. Now, the objective function is, see in this case, we have three objective function, minimization of cost, minimization of fold loss and maximization of uh, re network resilience. When it comes to cost, I have divided the cost also in different components so that it is easy for us to understand. For example, the total cost function is a sum of total holding cost, total cost of building a infrastructure, total cost of transportation and distribution. So Z11 that we are seeing is the total holding cost considering the inventory holding expense at the facilities in stage one and stage two that is producing and consuming states. Similarly, cost of infrastructure is cost of building a silo plus additionally cost of green, uh, building a railway siding in case our silo selected is not having a railway siding. Now, uh, Z13 and Z14 are both the cost of transportation and distribution. Z13 is between Mondays to the storage facilities because it only happened once a year. It is independent of time. And Z14 is between all the possible nodes that is happening throughout a year. So that is total cost. Then other objective is minimization of food loss. In this, I'm actually considering that the degradation and rate and the inventory. So this should be minimized. So in this case, depending upon uh, at what temperature inventory is stored, degradation will happen. For example, if I'm storing it at warmer temperature, it will be easy to or less expensive to maintain or the electricity will be less expensive in this silo storage. But it could happen that it will still get, uh, the food loss will still happen. So it is again a trade-off with cost. And the last one is maximization of network resilience, wherein we are saying the uh, e since each location had a resilience store score, so we should be locating in such a way that overall resilience is getting maximized in the net. So in order to solve this mathematical problem with three conflicting objectives, now let me uh, invite my co-author, Professor Mahima, to take one from here. Should I share this slide? Or I, either way. Yeah, I think. Should I stop uh... sharing? No, no, I think you can scroll it down for me if it's okay. Okay, okay, okay. Just okay. Uh, so, um, as we have uh, heard that now we are talking about three objectives. So, these are three objectives which are incommensurable and conflicting in nature. As my co author mentioned, that they conflict. For instance, if I want to have lesser cost 
it means I would like to store them at uh, the storage which are not temperature controlled and even if they are temperature controlled, I will store them at higher temperature so that I can save on the cost. But if I save on the cost, that would lead to higher degradation. So these are the conflicting objectives. Incommensurable in nature because some of them are mentioned in cost, some is, uh, some is uh, in, uh, mentioned, uh, some is captured in terms of quantity of food loss. So we have used the fuzzy sets to establish a trade-off between these objectives and arrive at a solution which is considering all these objectives. So for instance, what I did, the, there are, there's cost minimization one objective, resilience maximization one objective, and we have the other thing is food loss minimization. So there are two objectives which are of minimization nature, one is maximization nature. So I'm explaining how did we deal with minimization type. We define uh, their membership function. So as I can, as you can see on the slide, we define that if the achieved value of objective function is less than the lower value. So we will say that we have fully satisfied the achievement of that objective because that is a minimization nature objective. But if it exceeds beyond an upper bound, then we will say that our satisfaction level in that objective is zero. And in between the lower and upper bound that has been shown as NL and NU in the uh, figure, the satisfaction decreases from one to zero. It starts decreasing linearly. So that has been defined as the function mu z shown on the slide. Similar approach we adopt for maximization approach, only the function definition will change. So here we will say if the achieved function value is greater than upper bound, my satisfaction is one. If it is less than lower bound, it will be zero and it will be decreasing linearly from upper to lower bound. So in this way, we can uh, identify the membership function of both minimization and maximization function. Once we have the membership value of objective one, that is cost, objective two wastage, objective three resilience, we will aggregate them using fuzzy aggregation operator. We have used induced OWA here, where the weights are accorded to the objective function based on their importance level. So this is how my objective function, my formulation would be, I will have one linear objective function and we will add a constraint that the membership function value is less than equal to one. So moving to next slide. So what we did, we illustrated our methodology on the case study where we took eight procurement center that is Mundi, where we will say the required amount of grain is already there. There are go downs, five go downs in producing state these are the storage points where, which are not temperaturally controlled. Then we have existing silos which are temperature controlled. Similarly, in the second stage, we have seven go downs and five silos. Now we have given an opportunity in the model in case the capacity is not adequate. Eight locations have been identified in producing states, eight in consuming states, and if need, if there is a need, we can construct new silos there. We have taken five temperature points in which we can store the grains and as the temperature increases, cost of storage decreases, but at the same time degradation increases. And then we have seven retail points in which the ultimately food needs to be reached and we have studied this pro problem over six time periods. So the next slide gives the uh, representation of how the food is uh, transported. The links show the movement of goods from a particular node to another node. And as mentioned earlier in our methodology, we have accounted of three modes of travel, road, rail, railroad. So for instance, between the go downs, that movement is through roads. Between, exist between silos, the movement is through rail. And some points, the movement is in the mixture of rail and road transport. And this is what, as we mentioned that here, we will get visibility how the grains are moving from mandis to go downs, from go downs in, on in producing states to go downs in consuming state, and ultimately how they are reaching to the demand point. So this is how we have shown it in the graphs. So moving on to the next slide, we also uh, validated our approach of using multiple objectives 
So we can have all the graphs and then we can see. So what we have seen here, we uh, consider we ran our model on uh, three problem sizes. Here yeah, the size is defined by the number of mundis and uh, silos, time points, temperature points. So we categorize them into three uh, cat uh, three levels: small S M S one, S two, S three; medium M one, M two, M three; large N one, N two, L three. Here, let's let me explain the first graph that is cost. What is happening here? If I just focus on cost minimization, which is the traditional objective of supply chain, we see that the other two objective, that is resilience and food loss, are achieving maximum to the forty percent level. Right, and when I come to second graph, that is where my focus is only resilience. Resilience is maximized, but as I can see, other objectives are not realizing their value beyond point four. Similar thing happens in food loss. So if I go back to the cost objective, we can see that how economic uh, criteria or objective conflicts with other welfare-based approaches. Maybe we are saying resilience and food loss. So. Comparing these three graphs with the fourth graph, the fourth graph shows our approach, fuzzy multiple objective approach, and these three lines show that how the three objectives are satisfied here. And as we can see here, most of the problems, the satisfaction of the objective is very high. It is more than point eight in all the instances. Comparing it with the single focused approach, it is clear here that when I take multiple objective approach. I am able to have a more balanced decision. Next slide, please. So the contribution, as you can see here, we are able to understand the decision throughout the entire supply chain, right from storage to transportation. We are able to see the multiple aspects where we are minimizing cost, but the, at the same time reducing food loss and as well as working on the resilience of the network. It provides a framework where we can quantify how well, how resilient a site, and this can be helpful to identify the location where new silos can come up. We have identified, we have established the relationship between storage temperature and food quality degradation, and the best, uh, the major part of the formulation is we can understand the trade-off between operational objective that is cost. And strategic objective that is resilience and to some extent food loss minimization. Limitation is as you could uh, could have uh, thought about also during the presentation that given the structure of the problem, it, its size could be huge. So maybe in many situation, exact solution might not help. Though whatever experiments we did, we were able to solve the problem in a reasonable time. But obviously, if we just expand it and we see it at granular level, the size would increase. So maybe we can think of extending this approach with meta heuristic. Right now, when uh, the second point is when we studied resilience, we just looked at one site in isolation. But we think we can uh, we can capture resilience in a better better way if we think of it as a network rather than a site in isolation. Since uh, the PDS system not just just not just look into one grain, it's a combination of grain. So this can be studied in multiple product supply chain. And last but not the least, that this work can be extended and its efficacy can be enhanced by integrating industry 4.0 technologies to the PDS system. So that's what we have to present. Thank you for your attention. So if you have any questions, we would be happy to answer. Please raise your hands if you have any queries. We'll take them up one by one. Uh, Ma'am, uh, this is Atul. Uh, Ma'am, uh, you told that you have taken the procurement. Uh, why don't you have taken the time indices for the procurement? Actually, if you will take the procurement and supply it at t equal to 1, won't it just shoot up the capacity required? Means if uh, because the procurement happens all through the season or all through the year. No, I thought procurement only happens at the time of harvest. See, yes, usually uh, all the people who are beneficiaries of public distribution system, technically every month they should get the uh, supply of ration or whatever amount government has decided for them. 
and yes, that amount government is fulfilling from their uh, uh, stock yes. Stock. And the stock is replenished once in a year, that is at the time of harvest. For example, rice procurement, I guess, is uh, happening now. Wheat procurement happens sometimes in April and May, May yes, for the government. So we have assumed that procurement is a one-time activity. And for the purpose of modeling, we have considered it to be time independent. That, that was the only reason because, uh, see, uh, government procurement for every crop, there is a time that government decides that only during that time procurement happens. See, you can't grow wheat throughout the year and sell it. Uh, likewise, ki, the rice procurement mainly happens from October to January and wheat procurement happens in April and May. Right. So, but that is just a one-time activity. So uh, even if it is happening, let's say from 15th April to 15th uh, May, we yeah. have only considered it to be one-time activity. But ha, as my colleague, uh, Professor Mahima said that when we look at this problem uh, as a multi-grain, because public distribution system wherein we have multi pro government also procures different kinds of uh, grains, not just rice and wheat, but also sunflower, also other grains. So in that, because year long one, there could be some procurement that is happening. In that case, we can uh, take it to be a function of time. But when we look at only wheat, for, for our case, we, we just focus on wheat. So uh, that is just that was just happening in one um, year. Okay. So that was the logic. So uh, as you have already told me that for the T equal to one, that demand centers will receive grains from the existing stock. Exactly. Uh, so that also answers my second question. Now, one thing more that uh, you have uh, in the paper, you have mentioned that the holding cost at temperature T. So does it vary with the temperature that cost? See, uh, obviously, uh, I thought to answer your question, see, uh, when in the malls, when you go, when footfall is less, they turn off the AC, right? So that means their cost varies with the temperature. So the same thing happens in a silo storage. In the go down where you don't have to maintain the temperature for entire storage, it will be easy or cheaper for you to hold. But where you also have to, these, these steel silos are huge steel structures where grain is stored in bulk. And the moment you want to reduce the temperature by one degree also, the cost can significantly vary. Okay, ma'am. So, ma'am, uh, grains decrease, as you mentioned, that grains degrade at every temperature. So, is there something as optimal temperature? Just I want to have an idea of a range at which the, it is minimized. Atul, there can be uh, the degradation function that we have taken. We have actually used a formula from an already published paper wherein they have established a formula to act, uh, find out the degradation rate at different temperatures. But where you say that it is optimal, now optimal will vary the moment you are looking at it as a single objective or a multiple objective, right? Because if it is only the matter of temperature, that means you store at a temperature where it is, uh, degradation is minimum. The moment there are other objectives involved, for example, you also have to minimize the cost at the same time, so optimal can vary. And this is something that we were studying in our uh, you know, experiments where we have considered different uh, problem sets and we have seen that what happens at different, uh, in different problems. Okay. So, ma'am, you gone for the PDF case also. So, uh, did you have that data was authentic from the FCA website and for which specific states you took? Can, any idea? Uh, Atul, uh, the data uh, authenticity, see, we have taken data from FCI website. And mostly they have taken, see, for example, every year, whatever procurement is happening, region wise is given there in metric tons. So we have taken notional data to solve our initial case that we have shown. Okay. But for the experimentation that we have done later on, so we have taken, for example, if in last five years, if, I, if it is ranged between certain and certain values, we have used these values as our brackets and we have induced random numbers within those range of parameters against each parameter. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Hello, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, I just want to know that in your model, the 
demand is basically FPS or just a consume uh, go down in a consuming state. Uh, Shalu, for the sake for the um, uh, sake of modeling, we have uh, taken demand in the consuming state. Okay, you're not extending from warehouse to the FPS. It is it's not considered in your model. As in Shalu, uh, can you repeat your question? Um, I just think if from go down to the FPS, which is the last point for the PDS, have you considered that note in your model or not? See, the moment when we are saying that there are retail centers. So okay. that means these are government agencies where demand is happening. Okay. Okay. Until and... that point, how grain will move? First, we government will procure the grain. It will be stored somewhere in the producing state itself okay. for the initial part of it. And then it will be given to the states where demand is happening. But before directly sending it to the retail points, it mm -hmm. will be stored in the government owned uh, storage house. Mm -hmm. And then it will be released to the retail stores where uh, there will be no storage that will happen. So in every time, any time period, whatever is the demand, you're supposed to send only that much. Okay. It, for, in a month, only one time the grains are stored or you send it in a weekly or a daily basis? Whatever is the function of time. Here we have taken okay. time to be month, month on the okay. monthly basis. So it, that, that will be the frequency. Okay. Ma'am, you have mentioned the you have uh, optimized the cost. And for that, you must have calculated the distance. Yeah. So uh, which technique basically you use for that, for calculating the distance or the cost? See, uh, Shalu, honestly, to induce an idea of the uh, distance, what is the tentative? For example, let's say if you're sending something from Amritsar to, let's say, a consuming state, which could be, let's say, a, some, some district in Assam. Mm -hmm. So we have taken the estimate of distance as a rough estimate using Google Maps only. Okay, you are using a Google Maps only. And basically having an idea how much variables are in your model to calculate the results. But since it is a very large problem, na, it won't be possible to have such a large data and calculate on the Google. So that's why I'm asking you how much. So that it. is why, Charlie, if you have seen our illustration, we have kept only a limited number of go downs. For example, in producing state, mm -hmm. there are four go downs and five silos that we are considering in consuming state seven go downs. So that is what we are saying. The moment we'll you have to take this on a let's say all India large. level you will have large number of variables that we will not be able to solve without the help of meta -heuristics. Actually, I was working on the same problem, so that's why I come across such right. a problem. In the moment it, it exceeds beyond 10, it will become mm -hmm. uh, an NP hard problem to solve. Yeah, I'm facing some problems, that's why. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Do we have any other query from anyone else? Please go ahead. Uh, uh, Ma'am, I have one question that you had taken three modes of transport. One is road, one is rail and another one is the mixed one. So within the third category, that is the mixed one. Again, there can be a proportion of part where uh, the portion may vary between the different sites. So have you accounted that or we have just assumed it to be a constant? No, we have assumed it to be a figure. If if you look in my presentation, I have also defined a variable wherein it is a proportion of distance traveled by road out of the total distance between any node I and J. If it is go down to go down, that means 100% of the distance will be by road. And if it is, let's say, between two silos because the bulk movement will happen using a railway, so it will be 0% by road. But let's say if you're sending from silo to a go down, where bulk it could be uh, partly rail, partly partly rail, partly road, then that proportion can be, you know, uh, if you know it, that can be generated and can be given in form of a matrix to the model. We have assumed it, like you know, we have assumed that somewhere from ten percent to thirty percent to fifty percent. See, that is a parameter that you can tweak in the model. Okay. Is there any further query? Uh, yes, Adhyak. Uh, if there's no one else, I would like to share something. Anybody else yes. waiting? Yes. yes. No, sir. Uh, Shivam is there. Uh, please go ahead, Shivam. 
hello ma'am i want to ask if uh, we have any concern with the opening of new silos or the storage points government owned in the model in the conclusion in your results we have any is opening of new storage point government owned or relocation of the uh, existing location point uh shivam as in as of now uh, we are not really considering relocation part but for the location of new silos because we are also trying to close the storage gap we have considered like as of now we have considered eight sites but i if i'm understanding your question correctly are you asking that do we have any constraint on number of silos that can be opened yeah that is that is also the next question and uh, do we have felt the necessity of opening of new uh, storage point in your result uh, shivam the first thing that you are asking if there is any limit so yes we have considered yes, that yes. Uh, there is a limit on the number of silos or the projects that you can take up either in pro producing and consuming states depending upon the state budgets and the partners that they have and the other question i'm not clear shivam what you are trying to ask uh means uh, are in your conclusion of your model uh, do we also conclude that we can open new uh, storage points yes 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 we have why yes, i think two in the producing two in the producing four in the consuming state okay. are being okay. opened thank you oh yeah this was me okay thank you Yes, so uh, uh, Harpreet, this is Nomesh here. Uh, thanks a lot for. Good evening, your, sir. Yeah, good evening. Thanks a lot for your presentation. I really appreciate both you and Mahima coming here and spending your time. Uh, you know, we're just out of the weekend. It's Monday, and we are holding you back in until the evening. Uh, so thanks a lot. Uh, you know, my question was first of all, let me you know say that the reason why you found those questions from Shalu so detail oriented is because she's working on a similar problem. And she is facing these issues around Google and Maps, and you know, getting making the full distance matrix, etc. Uh, my question was, you know, so there are two ways, right? Like you pointed out in your uh, in your extension as well, uh, to develop a meta heuristic and to use the fuzzy approach that you described. So between these, which one do you expect to work out better? Um, and what would you mean by better, right? That, that's the question. So. Uh... Thanks, Professor Nomesh. So, what uh, the fuzzy set approach we took uh, to address the problem of multiple objectives. So, because we wanted to see the trade off and establish a trade off by finding a solution. Meta heuristic, what we think that as when we were doing experiments also, when the problem became large scale as per our category, one of the problems it took us 20 minutes to solve one instance. So as it becomes more realistic, what uh, other was asking also, let's say I increase the number of points in producing state as well as in consuming state. The complexity with respect to the decision variables and constraints will increase. And we don't think we will be able to find a solution with exact method. So ultimately, if we want to make it uh, exactly where we can find solution to each to the retail level, it has to be solved through meta heuristics. Right. No, no, absolutely. That's why meta heuristics are there. But right. between meta heuristics and, and a fuzzy approach, uh, how would you pick and where would you, I mean, choose which approach to take? That's what I'm saying. I think what I understood that these are not serving the same purpose. Right. We said is just giving us a way to establish a trade off between objectives, which we have to do anyhow. And in the same way, meta heuristic is giving us a uh, framework to address a large scale problem, which we mm -hmm. have to do if we have a large scale problem. So I don't think both of can both of them. Uh, maybe my colleague would like to oh. chip in. <laughs> <laughs> Professor here, if I may add, and Professor Mahima, you can correct me. Uh, we used fuzzy approach just to convert our multiple objective problem into a single objective so that we can solve using our uh, solver that we have. 
Now, uh, we deliberately kept the size of the problem low so that we can solve using exact methods. But the moment we increase, for example, if we take it from six time period to 12 time periods, even in that uh, window itself, we might have to go for meta heuristic because our solver will be able to solve even single objective problems are also NPR in nature. So we use a fuzzy uh, approach just to convert a multi-objective problem into a single objective, but it is not really impacting or having any impact on the overall computational uh, size of the problem. The moment size will uh, increase, we will have to go with some kind of solution methodology approach regarding heuristics or meta heuristics. Sure. So I think we will have a look at the paper to understand uh, yes. the broad idea behind how fuzzy numbers are uh, addressing that issue, right, of multiple objectives. Um, but, uh, you know, the other way in which people would handle the multi-objective part is maybe looking at Pareto optimality, right, or using yeah. lexicographic optimization. Did you consider any of that at all, or did you use only no, the no, professor? Yeah, we, have not we, could have, we could have a Pareto optimal and then try to come up with a solution, but we used fuzzy set and created a preference function at the outset and then got the solution which optimized that. We did not take up that approach. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So, you know, to my mind, actually, maybe it might be worthwhile and maybe, you know, we'll see if our group can take it up uh, to do just a comparison of this approach with that one, right? Uh, taking the Pareto approach or taking the lexicographic approach and then comparing it with what happens to, uh, you know, the fuzzy approach that you're talking about. Um, and we'll probably get in touch with you if needed, right, to collaborate and, you know, see <laughs> if there can be some reasonable work done around that. Uh, Professor, that would be a wonderful idea. But just to answer, we did not uh, map the entire Pareto, uh, uh, this, uh, what we did, we did compare with the one objective optimized. Mm -hmm. In one of the slides, we showed also how our solution, fuzzy multiple objective is performing compared to single opti optimization of cost single optimization of uh, food loss and resilience. Right. So one uh, end of the Pareto optimal we took up. Correct, correct, correct. No, no, that makes perfect sense. I mean, yeah, uh, because that's exactly what you wanted to do, right? So I think from your perspective, this makes perfect sense. Uh, but the question in the mind of the researcher always is, you know, what are alternate solutions possible, right? And so all of this is in that spirit. Uh, but sounds good. Uh, thanks a lot. I think uh, I'm done, Adir. Is there any other query from anyone else? Okay, so in case of no further queries, we can end this session now. Thank you, Professor Harpreet and Professor Mahima for such an informative and comprehensive presentation. Would request the team members to please stay back. Thank, thank you, you so thank much. You thank, thank you. We really you enjoyed your questions. Yes, yes, yeah. So, uh, you know, we will keep in touch, right? And, and see if we can take this forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Adya, can you check if we have only our group or if there's other people as well here right now? Yes, sir. I will first need to uh, disconnect the live, right? Right, right, sir.